Well, you know, I remember Elisha had washed Elijah's hands for ten years, but he had a double portion ministry, didn't he? <laughs> Hallelujah. This afternoon, I've, I've just been asking the Lord how I can compress into the short time we have all these wonderful truths. You know, so oftentimes we get the idea that everybody understands these things when many people are coming in from time to time that it's new truth to them. And uh, we want to make it clear. Uh, the things that God is doing in this hour, he is uttering his voice before his army. God is speaking the voice of the Lord in the midst of his people. His voice is in his body. Hallelujah. His hands are in his body. And we need to realize that if a minister can speak the word of the Lord, a minister also can stretch forth the hands of the Lord. There's no difference if he can speak God's word uh, uh, or a man or woman who has the gifts that God has placed in the church that speak forth his word, him speaking in the midst of the church. If he can speak through lips of clay, he can work through hands of clay. Amen. And we need to realize that God wants to show forth his glory in the midst of his church, confirming his word. And that word confirm has come to mean so much in our lives and in our ministry. Uh, in the 12th chapter, 14th chapter of Acts, it speaks of Paul and... Uh, Barnabas preached the gospel beginning at the 21st verse and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. In that same, no, in the 15th chapter, uh, the church in Jerusalem, sending forth these ministries, said it seemed good, beginning at the 25th verse, it seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and, Saul, and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. The Holy Ghost and to us. Men of God who had the mind of God that were one with the Holy Ghost, that as they spoke, it's the Holy Ghost speaking. Uh, what do you think it was in the 13th chapter of Acts? where it says, Now there was at the church at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, among whom were Barnabas and Simeon called Niger, and Lucius who was raised up with Manion and, uh, and Saul. And while they ministered unto the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the ministry into which I have called them. Now the Holy Spirit spoke. I was thinking when our brother Schisler was telling about that God said they should go back to Argentina and, they, and certain definite directions, that they should not go in a certain way, but that they should go in another. Now how did God say it? Was that just an inner impression in their mind? Or did God speak through some vessel? And in this church at Antioch, it says the Holy Ghost spoke. Well, how did the Holy Ghost speak? Was this just an impression that was in their hearts that they should gather together around Barnabas and Saul and send them forth? 
the Holy Spirit spoke. But the scripture just before that says, in the church at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Now, if there were prophets in that church, then the Holy Spirit spoke through prophets who are set to reveal the mind and the will of God. That's what prophets are for. And the scripture makes it very plain, though many have denied it and don't see it, that prophets are set in the church till we all come in the unity of the faith. Scripture makes it plain. This is the ministry that should be continuous until we all come in the unity of the faith. And they are set, along with apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the edification, of, for the preparation of the, of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ, for the building up of this body of Christ. And people who are desirous to know the mind of God ought to be able to hear his voice and ought to be able to know unmistakably God's will for them. Someone says, well, am I going to be directed by prophecy? No. No. I don't believe anyone needs to receive a prophecy that doesn't have a double witness to it. Amen. And doesn't have this word, confirmation. Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets, now, and Jude, in the 32nd verse, And Judas and Silas, being prophets, also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. I'd like to take just a few minutes to enlarge upon what is meant by confirmation. Now, among the uh, old line churches, They've had confirmation. In some places, the bishop will come along and will pat them on the cheek and say, your name is so-and-so, and they give them another name. And that touching them on the cheek is a carryover from apostolic days when hands were imposed upon them and the voice of the Lord and the anointing of the Lord was conferred upon them through confirmation and the knowledge of their calling of God was made known to them, not by one voice. The word confirm means lending a double witness, establishing, strengthening, giving a, an extra anointing. And that is exactly what happened. The prophetic word in confirmation can be in three different forms. It can be a message of things which are already past. A revelation that God gives through prophetic utterance can be of something that has happened in times past, but it's giving a double witness to it. That is confirmation, making strong. That same prophetic utterance can be something that now is an impartation, and that, that from that moment on, it's beginning to operate. Prophecy is creative. Prophecy is creative. But it is also promises. When it's concerning the past, it's confirmation. When it's concerning the present, it's impartation. When it's concerning the future, it's a promise. That's why it's rather difficult at times to get chronological sequence or just proper time element in it. It's so hard because when God says, Behold, I do this, it may be something he already did 20 years ago. It may be something he's doing now. It may be something that's going to happen just up the road a little way. But faith lays hold of the promises of God. There was words of rich prophecy that was spoken to Israel that they never entered into as a whole. Why? because it was not received in faith. There were those to whom a prophecy was given and promises were given that never entered into it either. And they died in the faith, not having obtained the promises, 
but were persuaded of them and embraced them. God give us that embracing faith that will receive not as the word of man, but as the word of God. But again, you say, oh, we can be deceived for there's false prophecy. And that is true. There is false prophecy. And God warns us against false prophets. And if he did not realize or know and, and want us to believe that there were real prophets, he would never war warn us against false prophets. For if there are false prophets, there have to be true prophets. There just have to be. We always used to say, would you accept a $3 bill? You, you, you know you wouldn't, because it's false from the beginning. There aren't any $3 bills. So there has to be the real if there is also the false. In the 30th chapter of Isaiah, I'd like to for a moment take these few verses. Beginning at the 18th verse, Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. I'd like to say this before I read any further, that this 30th chapter of Isaiah, there's running continuously in these verses blessing and cursing. There is the time when God's judgment is poured out upon a people that are not ready to receive his goodness. And there's also the knowledge that at the same time that his judgments are in the earth, that his blessing is upon his people. Hallelujah. I want you to notice that as we read these verses. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. And then he says a little later on that... Uh, he would give the rain of thy seed, and thou shalt sow the ground withal, and the bread of the increase of the earth. It shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall thy cattle feed in large pastures. I don't just believe in spiritualizing all the scriptures, but sometimes when I read these verses, I don't see cattle at all. I see people. <laughs> when I see oxen, I don't see oxen at all. I see burden bearers. When I see young asses that ear the ground, I think of those who are quick with perception. You know, these young asses that ear the ground, they can tell when there's something coming, whether it's miles away, just by the sound that's in the ground. They can run there for protection. And God wants to have his people with such keen spiritual perception. Hallelujah. And he says what will happen to them. The cattle feed in large pasture, the oxen likewise, these burden bearers in the church, and these that have given, been given keen spiritual perception that ear the ground shall eat clean provender, not that which is tainted with so much of flesh and self. And dear ones, God graciously moved 20-some years ago with a mighty revival, but it became contaminated because it was poured into tainted vessels. This is so. It was poured into tainted vessels. It has to be clean, pure vessels that can contain the clean, pure word. And I would encourage anyone, if you want to hear the voice of the Lord, if you want to get a pure revelation, if you want impartation, take time to cleanse the vessel. I, I, I through the years, I look back at the time when God spoke so graciously, and he did speak graciously, and it was the voice of the Lord, and I knew it was his voice. How I knew it was his voice. 
because he told me things that only he and I knew. Nobody else knew it, but it was confirmed by the prophetic word. Uh, let me recount a little experience. I was down with the Grubbs in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, we had been teaching on these things of the God's end time moving in this way, and voice of prophecy, and his, his confirmation. And one brother stood up who was an evangelist. He had a large tent, and he was, he was doing a good work. But he did not see that he had to listen to the voice of the Lord. He thought he knew, and he would get from God. And he said, I'll tell you, I know what God's been dealing with me about. He said, I hear people say about uh, others can tell what your ministry is and where you're supposed to go. He said, if anybody could tell me what I already know, I'd believe it. And little Robert Barkley jumped up over seats and scrambled over and put his hand on the top of his head. And he said, Behold, and behind the iron curtain thou shalt go. The fellow began to cry and he said, Only me and God is so bad. <laughs> I, God can dig them out. Uh, God can show his, vo his hand and, his, and, and can give his voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise his precious name. And the Lord spoke to me back there, things that only he and I knew. And he spoke some precious things and things that I, uh, I knew I didn't deserve. In fact, the ministry that he had spoken, when I, when I got home that night, I said to my wife, I sure don't know what, I don't know what this means. But it must be something wonderful. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Is it? Judas is very at this point. <laughs> it isn't what we're called to be. It's what we do with what we're called to be. I said, Well, it certainly is something, it must be something wonderful. And I said, I don't deserve these things. And God spoke to my heart. And he said, I didn't give them to you because you deserved them. I gave them to you because you needed them and because I love you. Now guard them safely. Live a holy life. And I believe that that's an exhortation that we can give to anyone who's seeking to hear the voice of the Lord. He doesn't give you because you merit God gives us because of his grace, because of his love, and because of our need. My God shall supply all your needs. Oh, be needy. Be a needy people. Be conscious of your need before God, and he will supply. Do you know why the Laodicean church didn't get anything from God? Because they didn't have any need, and yet... He gave them just exactly what they needed. Nothing. That's what the scripture said. They had need of nothing. So God supplied them. Nothing. Oh God, make us needy. Make us conscious of our lack. Make us so dry. Make us so thirsty. Make us feel so insufficient that we cry aloud to him for equipment and he'll equip us he will equip us hallelujah for heaven is loaded i mean it heaven has the storehouses full of rich things of rich things that god wants to bestow but he can't find vessels enough to give them to hallelujah hallelujah they shall be given, I'm going to go back to this, shall be given to eat clean provender, which hath been winnowed with a shovel and with a fan. And there shall be upon every high mountain, upon every high hill, rivers and streams of water. We've been talking about those rivers and streams. And we're believing it, that out of our innermost being are going to flow these streams of water. God has richly, when my people... Hallelujah. Thirsts and hunger. I, the Lord God of Israel, will not forsake them. 
I will open up rivers in the high places and streams in the desert. Hallelujah. I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Are you dry ground? Are you thirsty? Are you thirsting for these streams of living water? Or are you sufficient? Do you have enough? Are you content with where you are? Don't you need anything more from God? It seems like we don't. We're full. The altars are empty a good bit of the time. But if you're really thirsty, if you're really hungry, it doesn't have to be at an altar either. He said, when you pray, enter into your closet and close the door, and there commune with God. And he which seeth in secret will reward you open. Hallelujah. You've been praying for something, desiring it, and all of a sudden someone who doesn't know anything about this has a message from the Lord for you, and hands are laid upon, and the thing you desire becomes your possession. Hallelujah. God wants to impart. God wants his people to be equipped. This is the hour. This is the hour. And let me tell you, it's soon going to pass. I mean this. This is soon going to pass. And like the five wise and the five foolish virgins, all virgins, all had lamps, and all had oil in their lamps. But some of them didn't have enough. They didn't have the extra portion. They didn't have the extra bottle of oil on the side and because the bridegroom tarried they slumbered and slept but when the cry went forth behold the bridegroom this may be a new slant to some uh, I know it's been preached that these were those that didn't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost <laughs> but I, I'm sure it's those who don't have the extra supply of oil so what is oil it's the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God isn't it isn't oil the anointing of the Spirit of God and when they all awakened, they found that they didn't. And they went and said, give us of your oil. Oh, thank God we're been in a time of COVID. There's been a time when those who do know their God have been able to receive from God. And I thank God somebody invited to me. And the Bible says, freely ye have received, freely give. And I've never sold a prophecy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A man once came up to me in the service in Astoria, Long Island. said, Dear, as I need to get to heat, would you please pray for me? I felt like saying like John and like Peter did to that man who said, Give me the power that whomsoever I lay hands, they'll receive the Holy Ghost. And he said, thy money perish with thee. You can't purchase the things of God. You can't purchase them. They aren't for sale. They only come because of a need and because of a heart preparation. One thing more about gifts. I mentioned this to one of the brethren here the other day. It was here, right in this school. We were trying to show at one time that when you covet earnestly the best gifts, we weren't all going to ask for the gift of prophecy. You know, some people think that the gift of prophecy is the best gift. And, 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 and when the Bible says covet earnestly the best gift, it doesn't mean we should all desire the gift of prophecy. So God always gives us the things we desire. And everybody will get the gift of prophecy. No one have anything else. But uh, we were trying to teach that when you covet earnestly the best gift, you were coveting what God wants you to covet because the preparation in the heart of man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. That's the scripture. That is the scripture. And so what God puts in your heart to desire is the thing he wants to give. And so I was asking, I said, which do you think is the best gift? One said, word of wisdom. Another one said, word of knowledge. Another one said, prophecy. This young fellow said, I think gifts of healing. And I just felt inclined to ask him why. And I said, why do you think the gifts of healing is the best? He says, because it makes you more popular. And I, I didn't tell him so. Uh, 
But I thought he's going to, that boy's going to wait a long time before he gets the gifts of healing. <laughs> because God doesn't give you gifts of healing to make you popular. But I'll tell you what can bring forth the gifts of healing in anyone's life that desires it enough. And that is, if your heart of compassion goes out when you see a crippled person, you feel if I could only put my hands on him, if I could only stand upon him and he would become strong, I believe if you have that sufficient in your heart, God will give you that strength to do it. I believe that's the thing that's needed, the compassion and the desire to be used to God, not to make you somebody, but that they should have the goodness of God in their lives, and that God should be glorified to it, and I believe he'll give you every good gift that will make you effectual for the work of the Lord. I believe that with all my heart, and he won't deny any good thing. Hallelujah from them that walk uprightly. That's his word. God wants us all to be equipped not everyone to have every gift of the Spirit. God forbid we wouldn't need anybody else if that was so. But God wants His body to be filled and equipped that there shall be no lack. And He does say about the gift of prophecy, He said, if you all prophesy, and one comes in that does not believe these things, he's unlearned of these things, and the secrets of his heart are made manifest. He will fall on his face and confess that God is in you of the truth. Do we not want to convince the world that Jesus is in the midst of his people? Are we not interested in seeing Christ made manifest, Christ turned forth in the midst of his church? Do we not want to convince the world that Jesus is real? Then hallelujah, he wants the church to be equipped. Hallelujah. He wants us to have the entire mantle of his power in, in the whole body, not in one individual. I never like, never like to pray for sick people all by myself. I don't want them to go out and say, Brother Stuckman pray for me and I got my healing. I want them to say, I came to church and the Lord touched my body and healed me. Hallelujah. And so when we pray for the sick, we like to see a group of brethren draw around and no one can get the credit, only Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something else. I am jealous when I see somebody else taking the credit. I mean it. I'm jealous for the Lord. I'm sorry that he doesn't get all the glory for me. Hallelujah. I didn't mean to preach this loud. I didn't mean to get worked up about it. <laughs> but oh, God wants to move sovereignly on his people. He wants to glorify himself in you, in the body. He wants the world to see when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. Hallelujah. He wants to show forth his glory, and he will if there are vessels prepared. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me go on. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far. His breath is as an overflowing stream, shall reach to the midst of the neck, to sift the nation. Ah, this 29th verse. I didn't know that was there 20 years ago. Ye shall have a song in the night. <laughs> but hallelujah, God spoke it to one of his choice vessels that he knew was going to go through some night season. Not just 24-hour night season, but night seasons. And those songs are born in the night. They are. Oh, some will say, oh, I wish I could compose music. I wish God would give me songs and choruses like he gives Betty Price. Well, you paid the price. You can too. I said price. <laughs> Amen. God had said concerning this ministry that he would give her songs in the night, songs of deliverance, songs of courage, and songs of strength. And you know they are, don't you? You know they are. Hallelujah. They are songs of courage. They are songs of strength. Hallelujah. 
The thing I like to see is sit back and see how God fulfills those things. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's so wonderful. It's God. It isn't man. It isn't man's doings. It isn't man's thoughts. It's God's doing. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Hallelujah. 29th verse says, Ye shall have a song as in the night, when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart, as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. And now notice the next verse. And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. And the lighting down of his arm. Hallelujah. Isn't that the laying on of hands? The lighting down of his arm and his glorious voice. Isn't that prophetic on earth? Hallelujah. Do you know what the spirit of prophecy is? It's the testimony of Jesus. And when Paul was going, wanting to come to Rome to, uh, to, to preach there, he said to them in Romans, the first chapter, and the, I believe it's the ninth verse. Eleventh verse. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end that you may be established, confirmed, settled, strengthened, made strong, Hallelujah. Given a double witness. Hallelujah. This is what he wanted to come. Listen, why couldn't he send it in a letter? It was just a message he wanted to give. He said, I long to come unto you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. First Corinthians. Hallelujah that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ. Now, what is the testimony of Christ? The spirit of prophecy. Do you want scripture for it? Revelation 19, 10. For the testimony, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's the scripture. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, if anyone seemeth to be contented, we have no teaching that you have to have hands laid on to get a gift of the Spirit. I don't think that's necessary. But I'll tell you, I found a lot of people who began to exercise in that direction that never had before. I did. I, my wife had prophecy for 10 years before I received it. The night they laid hands on me said, this night you shall prophesy. And I began to prophesy. I've been doing everything. <laughs> you can say you can't get it that way. I did. <laughs> Praise God. You can't, you can't tell someone they can't get a car if they've got one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But I'm not contentious. I don't say it's the only way. Neither do I say that the only way you can get the baptism of the Holy Spirit is have somebody lay hands on it. But I've seen hundreds, thousands of people filled with the Holy Spirit because hands were laid upon them. And it's scriptural. Philip went down to Samaria, preached Christ. Many believed, were baptized, but they didn't have the Holy Ghost. Some of our Baptist friends might kind of question that, but they didn't. <laughs> they believed they were baptized, but they didn't have the Holy Ghost. So when Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the gospel, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost, and immediately Simon had more discernment than a lot of Pentecostal people had. For he saw that by the laying on of hands, the Holy Ghost was given. And he said, give me this gift, a gift, a gift that someone had that other people didn't have. Do you believe that Philip was a true man of God? Certainly he was a rich evangelist. 
Hallelujah. But he did not have that ministry. And Peter and John had to come down from Jerusalem, lay hands upon them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And Simon wanted to have that gift. A lot of people like to have that gift. But you can't lay empty hands on empty heads. And you can't lay unconsecrated hands on heads and expect them to receive the Holy Ghost. Either. Hallelujah. But I'll tell you, God doesn't give you the Holy Ghost because you're holy. He gives you the Holy Ghost to make you holy. Amen. Amen. Praise his name. This ministry is not something that should be done in a corner. This is not something that should be done unadvisedly or by beginners, novices. Believe me, God never intended that people should get together and with, with uh, pride one lay hands on the other and say, Behold, God calls you to be an apostle. The other one lay hands back on him and say, God wants you to be a prophet. Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that in God's will. When Paul said to Timothy, Neglect not the gift that was in thee, which was given unto thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. He meant that mature men, and I'll say women, of God, who knew God, who had learned not only his acts but his ways, and had come into a relationship with him, and through exercise and proving, had recognized that they had a ministry. And let me tell you, we, we didn't come, I'm sure, none of those who now are, are recognized and their ministry is accepted in the ministry of prophecy didn't come into this just uh, haphazardly or they just they begin to prophesy that I've got the mind of God. God confirmed that to us in many ways. You know that for weeks, after it had been said that we would lay hands on others, as the prophecy had said this, and that I would have prophecy, I stood and didn't open my mouth while others... I stood with, with the brethren that were, that were laying on of hand, but I didn't open my mouth. But you know, all the time I say, Lord, show me. Lord, let me see these things that somebody else would say. And that's scriptural. Scripture says, let the prophets be two or three, and let the others judge. Now every prophecy must be judged. And it must be judged by mature ministers. And if you can't stand judgment of your prophecy, it's not in God. Hallelujah. In a great national convention, my prophecy was judged. The man stood up and said, I don't think that was God. And I stood up and I said, Brethren, I don't want any corrupt student and communication to proceed out of my mouth. I want you all to pray for me. And uh, many brethren came around and said, Brother Stutzman, we know that was God. The same prophecies come forth in our churches. Now, that to me was the thing that, that confirmed. I didn't resist or resist. And we should be in such a manner. The kind of a spirit that proves whether it's a God spirit or not is if it's pure, peaceable, easily entreated, seek it's not its own, is not puffed up. That's the, that's the spirit that's of God. The Bible says so. And if we don't have that spirit, it isn't the, it isn't the spirit that's from above. Hallelujah. It's, but from beneath. It's sensual and selfish. God help us that we will let our prophecies be judged and that we will judge. Hallelujah. Now, judgment doesn't mean that we've got the gift of uh, criticism in any way, but there's proof. We won't go into that. It would take too long. But there are many proofs of prophecy from the scripture. Oh, I think I could give them in a, quick, in a, in a hurry. First one. In the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy, the people said, How shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Did they not say that? And Moses said, 
If a prophet presumeth to speak in my name, and it cometh not to pass, nor followeth not, that is the word which the Lord hath not spoken. The prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. You need not fear him. That's what the scripture says. And these people who go around prophesying earthquakes and all these things and uh, uh, doesn't come to pass, even put time elements on it and it doesn't come to pass, you know they're, they're, they're witnessing to the world that it's a false prophecy. Amen. We should be careful of the words that we prophesy. That, that's the first one. If it doesn't come to pass, fulfillment is a proof of its prophecy. And oh, how precious it is to have God confirm the word with the signs that follow. Hallelujah. Second one is, if they speak not according to this word, there is no life in them. Isaiah the 8th chapter. I believe it's the 19th verse, right apart the 19th verse. Third one, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And I'll tell you, that's a good one. That's a good check. If you have a doubt of the prophecy that you may have heard, ask God to confirm it. I remember in Hornell, Brother Spencer, a brother from Ohio, I can't remember his name, but as he was called to the platform, the Lord spoke to my heart, said a prophecy. And then the Lord gave me a kind of a thumbnail examination of that man's character. I never knew him, never saw him before. Never saw him before. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I stepped away from the mic and you couldn't hear. Uh, God gave me a thumbnail examination of that man's character. I'd never seen him before, but I knew this was so. He was harsh. He was dogmatic. He, he, he demanded of other people exactness. He was a pastor of a church somewhere down Ohio. I'm glad I can't remember his name. Maybe some of you might know him and I wouldn't want to betray these things. <laughs> But uh, I, I said, how can he be a prophet? How can this man be a prophet of God and these things in his life? And so we got up there and stood around him. Not a word come. And I knew I was the key log in the jam. I, I, I knew that God had given me something to say and I couldn't say it because I was afraid to say it. And then I said this way, I said, dear God, if this is true, you let someone else confirm it. And Brother Frodson, who was standing right next to me, said, Behold the prophetic ministry. <laughs> he said it just like that. I said, Forgive me, God. And then I stepped forward and began to give the word as the Lord had given. And in love, let me tell you, in love, we had to speak the things that God had shown us. It's hard to have to tell somebody that they're dogmatic and that they've been harsh. But in love we did, and he began to break, and he cried, and each verse or each new thought that came forth, his head got down further and further and further until he was buried in the rug just like crying, and, and, and yet he was listening. And the, the prophecy ended up, and in that day shall they know that a prophet had been among them. And he stood up and he said, Oh, I know this is God. He said, all night long, God was showing me these same things, was showing me that these were in my nature, in my heart, and I want them out. I know God wants this. And he said, folks, then I want to show you something. And he brought out, do you remember this? He brought out a little black book from his pocket, and he opened it up, and he said, this was given to me 12 years ago. And went on with much of this, and it wound up, and in that day shall they know that a prophet hath been in their midst. Well, don't you know I knew that I had had the voice of the Lord? Don't you know he knew that I had the voice of the Lord? Don't you know that the other people knew that I would had the voice of the Lord? Because it was confirmed by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Believe me, you don't have to accept anybody's prophecy that tells you, Behold, I'm sending you to Kenya or Ethiopia or someplace else. Uh, if you don't have any witness, don't pack your bag. <laughs> But if God wants you, he'll dig you out. He'll dig you out. You can't get away from it. You may escape it here, but you go someplace else, and he'll, he'll, he'll dig you out. He'll expose you. He'll make you know that you're the one. And then possibly the third thing that you still uh, don't accept it, 
uh, someone writes a letter and says, The Lord laid it upon my heart to send you $100. I felt that you was going to go on some missionary trip. <laughs> well, you know that that's God then, don't you? Because the trend of circumstances makes us know in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Fourth one is this. Out, it's in James, the third chapter. Hallelujah. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought no, not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Hallelujah. If this is so, then you can't get good water out of a well that's sending forth bitter water. And if a person goes all week long with all kinds of enmity and strife and criticism and fault finding and then expects to come into church and have the voice of the Lord? I don't think so. The same, the well doesn't send forth bitter water and sweet water at the same time. So, if you want to have the voice of the Lord, be sure that the well stays sweet. Amen. Amen. One thing more. Uh, the vessel. The vessel. Uh, I know this. I know that the, the high priest, yes, we, it's time, we'll, we'll dismiss now in just a moment, so just be, be quiet, don't, don't, don't get restless. We'll dismiss in just a minute. But the high priest prophesied a true prophecy even while he was condemning Jesus Christ to death. He said, know you not that it is best for one man to die for the whole nation than the whole nation die? He was prophesying that. Now he was surely wicked, but his prophecy was a true prophecy. And that was because of his office. That was because of his position. This is, is, is so. And God wants us to know that the prophecies we hear are true prophecies. You can prove it. The vessel is an indication. Hallelujah. And one should not feel bad if his message is, re is refused, if his life doesn't measure up. He shouldn't feel bad if his message is refused, if his life doesn't measure up. You can't blame people for not receiving when they know that the vessel is impure. Amen. So, there's proofs of prophecy. You don't have to accept every word that said, Behold, thus saith the Lord. Prove all the, the same scripture that says, Forbid not to prophesy, quench not the spirit, forbid not to speak with tongues, also says, Prove all things. Amen. And you have a right to prove if it's the Lord or not. Uh, we're going to dismiss now, but... My brother lifted up his hand. You have a question. Oh, I thought there might have been a question. Well, amen. Is there anyone that does have a question on this thought? Now, I do not believe that uh, in every place we should, we should expect prophecy. More than that, you know there's some people who go every place all around the country just waiting to get hands laid on them again. They want to hear something pleasant. They want to hear some new truth. Use what you've got before you expect to get it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. More than that, listen, God has convinced us during this camp. The vast difference between lust and love. Lust is desiring to get. I'm not I want, I want, I want. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's not love, that's love. Love desires to give. God help us. That from us we want the enabling so that what is in us can flow out. That's love. That's love. And if your great burden is to give, God will give you the supply. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No good thing will he do.
deny from them who walk uprightly. Amen. Amen. Did we cover it? Is there anything we left out? <laughs> Praise the Lord.